a very warm welcome to all of you, uh, those who are here physically present and those who are virtually present. Uh, each one of you are very warm welcome uh, to the third series of uh, this talk, Parminari. What exactly is Parminari, etc., will be told a little later uh, by Dr. Vanyananal. Uh, so, <clears throat> welcome to the speaker and welcome to all others. And I'm sure we will fill up as we go along. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, yeah. Yeah, so a very warm welcome from Genuine Physics Working Group of IPA. IPA that is stands for Indian Physics Association. This was founded in 1970, and it's not new to the local audience here because Hyderabad the university has a has an active IPA chapter, uh, I think for donkey's years. The Gender in Physics Working Group was uh, set up in 2017 by uh, some of the senior physicists in the country. And I see two of them here, uh, at least two of them here. Uh, one is the speaker herself. The idea or the motivation behind it, being the gender uh, disparity or gender inequity in physics is a global uh, problem and it's a very acute in India. And this group was set up with a goal to provide a platform to discuss various issues affecting the um, increase to uh, various issues. So to promote the gender harmony, to uh, promote best practices, increase awareness, and also provide mentoring and networking, which is very crucial. The, uh, this is achieved through various lectures, workshops, also the specific programs, panel discussions. Mm -hmm. We also setting up the subdiscipline gender groups uh, now, which helps to uh, reach wide, uh, get a wider reach, as well as uh, also uh, look at the subject specific problems, which could be there in different disciplines. One of the major uh, forum or the major uh, task undertaken by the group was the organization of the conference uh, Pressing for Progress in 2019. This happened in the, your very own backyard. This was organized uh, uh, by uh, Professor uh, Pradwal Shastri and Professor Bindu Bamba, both of whom are present here today. And the, the deliberation, this was a kind of a unique effort, the first time in the country where the physicists and the social scientists came together and the deliberations culminated into Hyderabad Charter, which gives the guidelines for the gender equity. So we hope that some of this will soon become reality and will go a long way in addressing this issue in the country. The uh, other major task currently the group has uh, uh, is involved with is we will be organizing IUPAP sponsored international conference on women in physics in July, 2023. This will be online conference. And as a warm up or the preparation towards this uh, uh, big conference, this lecture series, Pavi Nari, Padartha Vigyan Ki Nariya, the woman in physics, woman physicist, has started. The idea is to uh, showcase and uh, cherish the work done by women physicists. Some of it is well known, some of it is remained hidden. Today is the third lecture in this series and which will be given by Professor Dindubhava. And I think it's very apt that uh, she, who has been instrumental uh, in making this group a reality, is giving this talk. So I welcome you all and look forward to your support for the activities of the JIPWG. I will put some links in the chat box about the group web page and the conference web page. So thank you, and I take this opportunity to thank University of Hyderabad, particularly Dr. Professor Rukmini Mohanta, who also is a chair of a subject uh, gender group of high energy physics for organizing this talk. So thank you. And we look forward to uh, exciting talk by President Dr. Bomba. Yeah, over to you, Rukmini. Good afternoon. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Bindu Bamba, 
Bangladeshi professor School of Physics, University of Hyderabad. She graduated from Punjab University, Chandigarh, and received her PhD in theoretical physics from University of Chicago under the supervision of the Nobel laureate Professor Kwai Nambu. She worked on the interrelation between particle physics, fluid dynamics, quantum optics, and cosmology. She was joint faculty in the Center for Women Studies, University of Hyderabad, working on sectors that affect gender equality in physics. She is a co author of the Hyderabad Charter for Gender Equality in Physics. She received the UNESCO Young Scientist Award for South Asia in 1991 and the Mother Teresa Award for the Sciences. Today, she is going to tell us about promoting physics across borders. Some women who open doors for others. Thank you, and over to you, Dr. Bamba. Thank you very much, Rukmini. Thank you very much, Vandana, and thank you very much, Ashok, and thanks to the Indian Physics Association uh, for um, hosting this lecture. Um, yeah, so I'm uh, today. I'm going to talk about uh, something a little different. I'm going to talk about not only women who excelled in their own fields. Uh, in the field of physics, but who actually wanted to serve society in some way and give back to give back their knowledge to physics. So they did not just work for their personal gain or for their personal laurels or uh, uh, ambition. They worked also to give back what they knew to others. So as you know, that uh, well, a lot of people ask me what is uh, Pavinari. So it is Padyarth Vidyan. Ki nariya, uh, nari, so it is the women of physics. Uh, but I will give you many definitions of pavinari as the talk progresses. This is not the only definition of a pavinari. So basically, the philosophy upon which these women I'm going to talk about based their lives was that if you have the lamp of learning, you should light others' candle with it. And um, uh, you know, as you grow older, like me, you will discover that you have two hands. One is for helping yourself and the other is for helping others. You know, so you spend the first half of your life helping yourself and the second half of your life trying to help others. And the twilight of your life, like me, our retirement is all helping others because I have no, nothing more to gain. Uh, so... Um, no, it is very important to break barriers, not only gender barriers, but it is important to break social barriers and national barriers when it comes to science, okay? Science and technology does not have a nationality. We, uh, we keep on saying Indian science, Western science, Eastern science, etc. Science is a system of knowledge. It is for everybody. So therefore, everybody should share in science. And therefore, we must we must do away, there are many barriers we have, in India we have social barriers, gender barriers, and we have national barriers. And we, uh, and some of these women helped break some of these barriers. And um, the other thing is that the scientific method also is place dependent because it, it is, it is uh, engendered by the society at the time. So in that way, science is intimately linked with society. So all the prejudices of society somehow penetrate into science also. And, and they shouldn't because science should be an objective system of knowledge accessible to everybody. And uh, that should be our aim, not to build barriers around us, but to be more open about our science. Okay, so, but most of the scientific research that I see done, it sort of begins with the premise that women are not as good as men, okay? But I want to just show you that this is not the case, you know? Women are as good, if not sometimes better than men. But uh, the idea is for women in science is not just for women. And I'm so glad that, that the audience is majority male because it, uh, the, the thing is that um, it is to create not a world that privileges women, okay? But a world that is equal, okay? So that is different. It's not to create a world for women. It's a cre to create a world which is equal. And that is very important because you know what diversity does is it brings different viewpoints into science. So not only will, uh, you know, will, uh, uh, will uh, people change, but society will also change because, and science might also change because it has different people looking at it. As I said, the social milieu is often reflected into, into science. And uh, so in that way, 
Pavinari is, Pavi actually means lightning in Marathi. So uh, Pavinari becomes blazing or lightning, women, women who are like lightning, okay? Um, so the thing is that often, you know, women do very well up to MSc. They are always at the top of the class and everything. And after MSc, the curve goes down, okay? And this curve that goes down, it's also a brain drain. It's because obviously they had a lot of brains to do well up to MSc. So that's one brain drain. We talk about brain drain across national borders that people from India go to, to the US or uh, to, or to Germany and other places, there's a brain drain, but there's another brain drain, and that is the, uh, the brain drain across gender, you know, across the gender border. So there is also that, that brain drain. And uh, it has been actually quite verified by scientific studies that biologically, the Y chromosome, which is the difference between men and women, men, women uh, is not linked to scientific ability. Okay, so, um, so therefore, to deny a nation equal opportunity for women is to create a brain drain. So this we can call the XX factor because that's what we are and XY is what the men are. Okay, so but they, okay, so now I come to some individual women who have made a difference in, in, in society. Not only have they contributed to knowledge, but they have contributed to our understanding of physics and to breaking some of these barriers. Now, one would um, ask, are there any periods in history which are more uh, prone to have um, uh, women thinkers? Uh, is there any environment that is required for equality? And it turns out when you look at history, the, the, the environments in which women prosper are the environments in which a change is happening, okay? So when, uh, so when there was a change, from, so when there's a transition and old ideas are questioned and new ideas are being explored, then women thinkers. And that has proved over and over again, that has proved to be the case. That every time there has been a change from say, uh, the dark ages, which were there in Europe to enlightenment from the war, after the war, when you go from war to peace, and hopefully when you go from COVID to non-COVID, which is a big period of change, those will be the environments in which, you know, women, uh, uh, it, uh, participation of women becomes more. And, and we have seen that in COVID, we had a lot of women participating in a lot of, um, you know, a lot of activities uh, about, you know, in which uh, women's rights were discussed. So, so every time there is, uh, so change is good is what I'm trying to say. Um, so in, in, uh, in um, Europe, uh, there was a change. It was from the dark ages where it was only religion and Catholicism to the age of enlightenment. Okay, and that was in the 17th and 18th centuries. And that was also when Newton lived. Okay, uh, and also Newton produced his work in a change from a pandemic to a non-pandemic. So there was a there was a big change going on, okay? The, the Black Plague had just finished in Europe. Uh, um, and, uh, 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 and the heliocentric theory had come into being. So th uh, there was a lot of change going on then. And it was, um, so what happened is that um, all of the world, uh, religion, etc., all of them were uh, questioned, okay? Everybody wanted, a rationale for everything. What is God? Who is God? What is religion? What is science? Okay, so people were asking these questions. So there was generally a rational analysis of everything. And in this time, the places where such things were discussed, there was a rise of places, salons, of gatherings of people, which we now call seminars. And there was there were coffee houses in which debates occurred. And they were debating societies. And, and the most important thing was there was print. The Gutenberg Bible had been printed. The Gutenberg Press had come. Okay, so there was print. So people could communicate by means of writing. Okay, so therefore, these, um, uh, so, so for women, all these things contributed to them 
taking active part in society other than being just a wife and mother okay so uh, so in the period of enlightenment and during this time there was a woman called emily du chatelet and i don't think any of you have heard it because we never mention her name when we teach classical mechanics but she is the discoverer of one of the most important principles in classical mechanics and more than that she is the person who newton's text was written principia mathematica was written in latin nobody could understand it he he developed calculus but nobody could understand that calculus they, he had not developed the language properly so what she did is she translated newton's not only she translated newton she explained newton uh, for the first time and what she did was she introduced leibniz notation into newton so calculus was discovered by leibniz um, the laws of motion were discovered by newton and what she did is what she used the calculus to describe newton and what we know today is basically in in classical mechanics text is basically due to her translation of newton which was not just a translation and so so if we do any classical mechanics today if we use uh, newton's laws if uh, it is due to emily de chatelet okay because otherwise it would have been just like some other the uh, some text you know some latin text like which was lying there and only very big scholars could who could read latin could read that text so she was the first one and so she she was very instrumental in in uh, uh, you know promoting the ideas of free thinking so um, so what happened is that before the french, this was before the french revolution that was another time when change took place mm -hmm. so scientists were not sure of how to quantify motion and uh, so the ideas about motion were formulated in newton by newton but it was but they were not transparent to everybody so what she did is that she tried to um, to say that i will publish as many scientific works that i i can so that these ideas are propagated and um, so what she did is she uh, established a research center uh, where uh, where she was and there she you know called people from all over europe and she also talked to the german scientists like leibniz and she talked to uh, kant who was a philosopher at that time and she modernized newton's text okay she made it into something which was mathematically readable that had a universal language and what was that universal language that universal language was mathematics okay so um so then um so she basically she was one of the great thinkers of enlightenment period okay so what um, there's a lot of speculation about her education but the main thing is that she was born in a rather privileged family so she did not have any hindrances from uh you know poverty etc and in those days most most of the people who did science were not people who were doing science to make a living okay they were uh, people who did science and they were supported by kings and 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 her father was a courtier in in the in, in the king's court uh, of uh, louis the 14th and uh so there are two things one is that his father discovered that she was very intelligent at 10 years old so he used to uh try and get her tutors in astronomy her mother put her in a catholic school but um, but also some say that she did not want her child to study some say that she encouraged her child to study but whatever it was um uh, she uh was a questioning person and um uh, so, uh, so she read all the uh, all the languages latin french italian greek she learned all those languages but the language which she liked best was mathematics so she said well i know latin i know mathematics let's see where i can use use the two okay so uh, when she was 18 she got married to monsieur de chatelet and uh, he was a marquis so very uh, so what happened is that she had three children and after that she reached an agreement with her husband that now i've done what i had to i've had three children i i set up the house and now i should be allowed to pursue my own interests and that is what she did and uh, so at the age of 23 she started learning proper mathematics and and she so she because she had the means 
uh, she could hire a tutor and she hired one of the best tutors, which was Demopotheus. And Demopotheus is the person who has given us the principle of least action. Okay, so he, he was very adept in, in, in mathematics and also somebody called Alexis Clairot, who has a number of mathematical theorems named after him. So, uh, so she, uh, she hired them and she taught, got, uh, she learned mathematics at the age of 23. Okay, so I mean calculus, uh, higher mathematics. And on one occasion, um, okay, uh, on one occasion uh, in one of these cafes and salons, uh, she was discussing her mathematical ideas with men and she was asked to leave because this is not a place for women. So she dressed up as a man and came to that cafe in order that she could discuss her ideas, okay? So, uh, but the most, um, uh, the biggest influence in her life came from a, a very famous French a philosopher, writer, scientist called Voltaire, okay? Voltaire was one of the leading lights of the time, but he always used to write these very critical articles. Those critical articles got him into trouble because, you know, he said that, you know, one should be follow the king, and one should not, one should question religion, one should, one should not say everything should be left up to, uh, you know, religion or nature, one, one has the property to know everything, and one has the property to question everything, or whether it is social, political, or scientific. So he got into trouble, and he was going to be jailed. So instead, she called him to her place in Siri, and uh, to, to live there. And then she, he became a mentor, collaborator, many say her boyfriend. So anyway, so he became many things. Uh, they, they, so they were a real collaboration and they set up a laboratory and they wanted to test Newton's laws and Newton's laws of optics also. So they tested Newton's laws of optics and they collected something like 21,000 books to build the, build the biggest library in Europe. And so by that time, she was studying the work of Leibniz. And um, so what she did is that with, um, with Voltaire, she, uh, she wrote a, a book called The Elements of the Philosophy of Newton. In those days, physics was called natural philosophy, in which she combined all of, uh, all of the mathematics of Leibniz with all of the physical concepts of Newton so that you could get uh, you know, so, so Newton's idea of calculus and Leibniz's ideas of calculus were merged together in this study of, of philosophy. But uh, what happened is that, um, what happens is that the, the book is published only under Voltaire's name, because in those days, you know, women didn't publish books. But Voltaire, in the, in, in the front piece of the article, he puts this lady with a hand on top, and that is supposed to be the goddess of learning. Okay, and that is Emily de Chatelet. So Voltaire, when he, he told his friend, um, I'm sorry. Uh, anyway, he told his friend, uh, she dictated and I wrote. Okay, so basically all the ideas, all the mathematics was hers. All Voltaire did was put it to uh, you. You can just see that uh, you can see this is her looking down, looking down on uh, Voltaire, who is writing. He's dictating. He's writing. So she he left that message there for her. Okay. So um, so basically, what happened is that she did everything else, but she was very very careful in uh, meeting deadlines, and she would keep uh, uh, her hands in cold water in order to stay up so that she could finish work in time. Okay. And um, so, but you know, just like many women now, even though she was so talented, she was very unsure of herself. And in many of her journals, one finds things like, God has refused me any kind of genius. Uh, and she once, uh, you know, she, uh, that uh, you know women must uh, must give up depending on men for everything you know so that is what uh, and have financial independence so 
So she corrected. Uh, so what what was her main contribution to science actually physics is that she is the one who proposed the law of conservation of energy. Okay. So up to that time, Newton had written in his book that energy is proportional to velocity, not that energy is proportional to the square of velocity. So how did she do that? What she did is that she uh, took uh, balls and she dropped them in. She dropped them in a clay, uh, like uh, what is it called? Uh, mitti, okay, in clay. So she dropped them and she saw how far they go, depending on how fast you drop drop them. So if it was dependent on velocity, then if you dropped it with one speed and double the speed, it should go double the distance, the ball. But what happened is when she doubled this, uh, the, the speed, it went at four times the distance. When she tripled this uh, speed, it went down to uh, nine times the dis uh, distance. So from that, uh, she, uh, uh, she formulated that the energy of the work done by the ball or the energy of the ball is proportional to uh, v squared, half mv squared, not v. Okay, and, and, and so she was the first to theorize that first that total energy is conserved. And secondly, that you know, because you don't lose any of the energy when you uh, drop the ball, the distance. And she also was the, uh, was the first to, uh, to deduce that energy is proportional to v squared, not to v. Okay, so she, uh, and she did it by simple experiments. So she also, um, uh, you know, she also wrote about the philosophy of physics. And in, in fact, they, at that time in, in France, the main uh, philosopher was Descartes. You know him from the phrase, I think, therefore I am. So, uh, and Descartes was of the opinion of a very uh, mechanistic philosophy, not in instantaneous velocity, which is Newtonian, did not, you know, did, uh, was not uh, accepted by French society. So she combined Descartes' philosophy, reached it by, with Leibnizian calculus in the middle. So she combined philosophy, physics, and mathematics, and made Newton a lot more accessible uh, to others. And this, of course, Um, she started participating in, there was a big debate on this kinetic energy, you know, because Newton said it was proportional to V, how dare a woman come and say it's proportional to V squared. And then there were a lot of experiments then carried out and it was finally established that uh, kinetic energy is in fact proportional to V squared. It was momentum that was proportional to V and there was a difference between momentum and energy. So she, uh, so then she said, okay, she I've written on the philosophy of Newton. Let me just take Newton and translate it so that everybody can know Newton. So she translated Newton's uh, book. And in that, she added the new notation of calculus also of Leibniz into that book. And so this is the, uh, the, uh, the translation of in French. This is the translation by, and this time she got her complete recognition also because it is translated. by Madame du Châtelet, and she finally, that wasn't what her aim was. Her aim was to actually bring Newton to everybody, okay? So she brought Newton to the public. So, and she took all of his uh, obscure ideas and she, you know, the, the concept of derivatives also she, uh, she introduced in his work. And so, in fact, she was a, uh, not just a translator of Newton, which is what most people say, oh, Emily du Châtelet, translator of Newton. No, she brought, um, you know, she, uh, she actually uh, gave a, a learned uh, translation of Newton, which actually illustrated more. So it was not just a translation, but an illumination. So what uh, was said about her when the book came out and was reviewed is that Madame de Châtelet has rendered a double service to posterity with her translation of the Principia and enriching it with a commentary. As regards the algebraic commentary, it is much more than a translation. Madame de 
Chakla based all the calculations and after each tap, chapter was completed, her tutor, that was uh, Monsieur Clairot, checked it out and corrected it. Um, uh, you know, Clairot had the calculations checked by a third person after they were written out so that it was morally impossible that an error would slip into the work by oversight. It is most astonishing that such a, uh, that a woman should have been capable of a task which required such depth and hard work on assembly. She believed that death was coming long before she was taken from us. From then on, her one thought was to use the little time she thought that remained to complete the work she had undertaken and so cheat death of stealing what she considered was part of herself. Hard and persevering work, continued lack of sleep by putting her hands in ice um, led, uh, uh, might have saved her life, but in, instead actually that led to her death and she died at a very early age, at the age of 35. Um, so, um, you know, you know, so, um, she, she often said, I mean, not as a mother or as a, a wife or as a partner of Voltaire or as a student of, uh, Mopatish, please judge me by my own merits. Okay. She, she always had that. And she always, um, uh, so what that provoked is that the German philosopher Immanuel Kant uh, admired her intellect, but she said that uh, with uh, a woman who conducts learned controversies on mechanics, like the Marquise de Chatelier, might as well have a beard. Okay, so this is what he had to say. Instead of saying, good job, you know, he said, well, that was the biggest compliment he could give her, that she might as well have a beard. Okay. So when she was dying, she, she made a request to the king and she said, if I were king, I would redress an abuse which cuts back, as it were, one half of humankind. I would have women participate in all human rights, especially those of the mind. So as I said, denying women the rights of the mind is also a human rights issue. And she perhaps is one of our first feminist physicists who gave so much of herself uh, in order to bring Newton to us. Okay. So now I come to the next era in which science, as I told you, and whenever there is an era of change, uh, women scientists th uh, have been seen to thrive. So I come to the next era, and that was um, the aftermath of the Second World War. And um, so now what happened is that in, uh, in Europe, as well as in India, after 1945, um, the physicist profession was very restructured. And um, so what, what happened is that there was internationalism suddenly. Physics became, became international. People were allowed to go from one place to another. People traveled. It was not just the privileged elite people who had the uh, means to travel, but because of the boat and post-war economy, it allowed non-scientists uh, who were working in the lab to travel to another lab. And so that gave, gave internationalism to science and that helped women, okay? Because if you're not, you can always, you, you, you could go to another country to do uh, physics. So it was in uh, uh, 1945 that the cir circulation of individuals um, and with them, their experimental practices and organization met methods went, um, you know, around the world of the physics, the physical sciences. So no longer was it just a handful of exceptional people traveling, but, um, you know, a new uh, transnational scientific community um, emerged and there was internationalism. Uh, and it was no longer prerogative of a few very, very intelligent people. Uh, science was no longer that. Science was more uh, distributed to the masses, okay? And this was very conducive um, it conducive to, to women because science was not so exceptional anymore. So uh, when, when something opens up, when the doors first open, they open to everybody. And only after that setting in. So one such woman was a lady called Cecile de Witt Moret. Okay? And she was born in 1922, 22, and she was brought up in Normandy, France. And um, she completed her degree in mathematics, physics, and chemistry because at that time, 
most women became doctors, but during that war time, uh, medical schools were closed. So, um, so she entered the University of Paris, and she was lucky enough to work in the uh, uh, Joliot Curie and uh, you know Irene Joliot Curie and Frederick Joliot Curie, the daughter and son-in-law of Madame Curie, their lab, and uh, uh, she published a thesis on production of pions in nuclear collisions. So it was a very, it was something else. This is 1945, okay? And Pion has just been discovered, okay? And here she is talking about what we do right now, heavy iron collisions. We, we work on production of ions in nuclear collisions. Uh, so, uh, you know, so she did that. But meanwhile, what happened is that uh, the, while, it was 1945, remember? So 1945, the biggest bombing of of World War history. It was the bombing of Normandy, which then led to the Allied forces uh, occupying France. France was under occupation from Germany, and Germany bombed Normandy. And then the American and English and French group liberated Normandy and there was D-Day and France was liberated. But the only thing is that when Normandy was bombed, uh, her mother, sister, grandmother all lived in Normandy. They lived in Cayenne, which is in Normandy, a, a town in Normandy. It was completely bombed and Cécile lost. Uh, uh, so this is Normandy, completely uh, bombed at that time. And so she it resulted in the tragic deaths of her mother, her sister, and her grandmother. So she still had a stepfather. She did not know at that time who her real father was, but it turned out that later she found out that her real father had been imprisoned in the Nazi camp. He was, he was Jewish and he had been imprisoned in the Nazi camp. And later on in life, she actually met her real brother after when she was about 50 years old. Okay, so, uh, so, uh, what, what, so, uh, so she faced, uh, so she really, um, faced a lot of uh, distress and, and discrimination, and uh, uh, but she endured and flourished. And I'll tell you how she did that. Okay, so she was uh, forced to take charge of her life. Then she had no support system left. Most of her family had perished in the war. So what she, but she was very very good. And because she was Irene Jolie Curie and Frederick Jolie Curie's, um, you know, uh, student. Um, they got her a job, a postdoctoral position in Dublin with Erwin Schrodinger and Max uh, and Walter Heitler. Okay, uh, Heitler actually is one of the people who discovered nuclear. nuclear uh, fission. Okay, uh, the second postdoc she got was because she was so good with Schrodinger and Heitler, she got it with Niels Bohr. What Bohr could, uh, uh, you know physicists at that time want okay so uh, she, you know, because of the war she fled to uh, to dublin and then after that she uh, she went to copenhagen and while she was in copenhagen with means war she got a telegram okay so this is the telegram you can't read it i got this from her daughter who's uh, a friend of mine so um so she she was invited to the institute of advanced study in princeton and the telegram says on the recommendation of Bohr and Heitler, I am glad to offer you membership in the School of Mathematics for the academic year 1948-49, and your stipend is $3,500, and it is signed by Robert Oppenheimer. Okay, and when she went there, there was uh, Albert Einstein, John von Neumann, Kurt Gödel, and it was arguably the most prestigious place to do physics in 1947. So she went to Princeton. And um, so one of the things is that throughout her life, she had a habit of saying yes. And this habit of saying yes really served her well because it got her into the Jolie lab. It got her into Dublin, Copenhagen, and Princeton. It got her afternoon tea with Paul Dirac in, um, uh, in, in London, a weekend at Cornell University with Freeman Dyson and Richard Feynman, during which she fell in love with path integrals. Okay, um, she went uh, with uh, Dyson's wife on many adventures, and in Princeton, she would always walk with uh, Albert Einstein because she said he and I had two things in common. We were the only one 
Once we without a car, everybody else had reasonably rational hours. Everybody else was working the middle of the night. So if there is one story about they also liked to go and have ice cream from the from the ice cream van because uh, uh, Albert Einstein loved ice cream. So he said, let's go and have ice cream also. Every day they used to have ice cream also from the ice cream van. So she was, so she did that. And um, so um, what happened is that, uh, uh, well, during the spring of 1950, I don't know why I can't uh, remove this from here. Is there any way I can remove this from here? I can open the chart. Okay. Okay. Fine. All right. So what happened is during the spring, the spring of 1950, uh, the French ministry then the France was coming up again after the war, after all the devastation, and so they are uh, they offered her a tenured position at the University of Nancy in France. Okay. So she had a job lined up for her, and she would have gone back to France and taken up the position and led a normal life. But she not to lead such a normal life because um, after this professional proposal, an American physicist there, Bryce DeWitt, who, if you know gravity, Bryce DeWitt is a very famous name in gravity, DeWitt Wheeler equation. Um, he was a postdoc there and he put forth another kind of proposal. So while they were having supper after a day of canoeing, he asked her for a hand in marriage and she said no. Okay. And the reason she said no is because my, my country has been devastated by war and I have to go back and serve my country. So she said no, but then she thought about it overnight and she came back the next morning and she told him that she will, she will agree to his proposal if, if in, in the marriage she be allowed to do uh, contribute to the building of, uh, of science in France. I want to contribute back the country from which I've taken so much in my country, and I will do that. I will stay in America with you, but I will have to contribute to building up uh, science in France. And that night, that day, they were married. Uh, so, uh, so she started uh, plans for a summer school called the Les Rouge School. It's the first, first uh, summer school of its kind uh, in 1951. And uh, the same year, after that, she had got the plans for the summer school ready. They got married, and this is them on their wedding day. Uh, what happened? Okay, right. Okay. So, I had the idea I would do Les Rouge, have a summer school for two months, bring together 20 people with no limit on that. On nationality or age, uh, the people responsible for I wanted to do something for France because I had felt I'd been very lucky because I as a woman I did not have a professional responsibility I could do whatever I enjoyed that's what she said okay so she was very uh, so what uh, in fact at that time uh, Cecile was a much better known physicist than Bryce DeWitt. Bryce DeWitt later on became very known but Pauli used to call him Mr. Moret and uh, because she was Cecile Moret and uh, so her major scientific uh, uh, contributions were finding the semi-classical approximation to the path integral, showing that Feynman's formulation of quantum mechanics excludes one type of statistics called parastatistics, and she extended it, and that has relevance in quark uh, physics, and anticipating anions. So she, before anions came to uh, for us to know, she had already anticipated that, uh, and uh, uh, she actually worked in collaboration with Feynman. And just after marriage, Homi Baba, uh, before they could start the institute, Homi Baba invited them to TIFR as a research associate. That was their first postdoc, was uh, after marriage. His first post, uh, postdoc was in uh, TIFR. And here they, she's seen in her party with Bryce, uh, with Bryce DeWitt. And they had their first daughter. Then they had three more daughters. So they had four daughters in all. So, um, so, so basically what she said is that in order to uh, contribute to the reconstruction of French research, and as a self-imposed condition for marrying a foreigner, she conceived the idea of establishing the Les Rouge Summer School. 
And she had two sources of in, uh, inspiration. One was the Nanaba Summer Symposium, which was organized by Richard Feynman. Okay. And the other was that she was a committed member of the Girl Guides. Okay. And the Girl Guides always talk about skills acquisition, sociability, strengthening, and network building. So network building is something that she learned from the Girl Guides. So uh, she, uh, so uh, what happened is that the men of France, though, did not want to have anything to do with it, okay? Because they were uninterested in talking to a woman about physics. Even though France had had Marie Curie and Irene Jolie Curie, they were still uh, hesitant to talk uh, physics with women. So what did, but the only women they did talk to were their secretaries because they took the dictation and everything from them. So what she did is she would wait for the women working in the government offices to go out for lunch. And then she used to slip into the government offices. And that way she got access she went into the uh, director's room and she would uh, talk about her idea of a physics study institute. The next week she returned, she would tell him that that was a great idea you had last week, okay? And make him think that it was his idea, not hers. And that way, what she could do was um, that, that uh, she kept up this technique until all the funding for the Ecole de Physique Slejus was a reality. Okay, so she used, uh, so, so for the next 22 years, now she's called Divit Moret with a hyphen, uh, led, uh, led the school, and uh, uh, 30 former students of the school went on to become Nobel laureates, and uh, uh, a winner of a PS medal, that is the highest medal in mathematics, credits um, his career to her. And people like Pierre Dugène and Claude Cohen uh, Tenuti identified the school as helping with their success. And in 1958, NATO started funding uh, more schools. And then Carges uh, uh, schools came. And then, um, uh, then all the other summer schools started coming. So this was the first of its kind. Okay. And what she said is that theoretical physics teaching is, in general, insufficient. In those conditions, it would be advisable to provide to French and foreign students and junior researchers during summer a basic education course, allowing them to tackle the problems of modern theoretical physics. The courses are roughly of a couple of months length, would be simultaneously simple, modern, and in intensive, with the syllabus allowed for the less experienced to also attend class. And the summer period would allow us to benefit from the presence of foreign professors in France who would accept to contribute while enjoying a picturesque region. So, region. So, she said she had experience of such schools, and she, um, you know, so the, so the idea got sold to the French funding agency. So, this is the this is Gaget, Car this is Mont Blanc, and this is this is an example of a student learning there in Gaget. Okay. So, physics in the Alps. Okay. So. Thanks to her exceptional, exceptional trajectory, uh, Cécile Dubit Moret became an effective academic entrepreneur, gathering funding and finding premises, and attracting for the first session, which was from July to August 1951. And who did she get? She got Walter Heitler, Leon Van Ho, Emilio Segre, Walter Cohn, Wolfgang Pauli, and Rico Fermi, all of them to lecture there at the institute and she got 20 students from all over the world to come there okay and the first session attracted 200 applicants but 35 were taken from the 200 applications which were in which they didn't deny any country so this is pauli lecturing this is the board visiting this is pauli lecturing at les Rouge. this is Fermi lecturing at les Rouge. This is Feynman lecturing at Le Rouge. Here is Cohen Tanutri, uh, and he actually mentions this in his Nobel Prize winning speech. He says it was extremely uh, Spartan. We were lodged in small wooden chalets, barely furnished. The classroom was an old chalet, slightly below. We sat on canvas chairs. The chalkboard was primitive. Discussions happened outside on the pastures. It was rough, but at the same time, very charming, very bon facet and very extremely pleasant atmosphere. And he uh, says that he attributes a lot of his success to the lectures that he heard as a student at uh, Les Mouches. Here are 
Valdeman, uh, Gelman Neiman is the quark model. Here is Bryce with her husband. And here is Kip Thorne, who won the Nobel Prize a few years back. They are discussing something on the blackboard at Newton. And the one that I particularly remember is Methods in Field Theory. This is a fantastic book. It, it gives the first time that many topics in field theory were introduced for the first time. And uh, there, there have been at least uh, uh, 93 different people teaching there. And there have been many Nobel Prize winners, both among the teachers. And, and, and these, I, I don't know if, if, see, people don't read books anymore. But if you go to the library, you all the little lectures are in books like this, these, uh, um, these uh, blue books, you know. And one more interesting thing is that Witten, Ed Witten taught there and he met his wife there. And they got married there at Le So it served quite a bit of purpose for many things. So in her own words, let us see what her, we should also remember her contribution. She just didn't, she wasn't just somebody who ran a summer school in France. She contributed a lot to physics also. Um, so my contributions are related to functional integration. This is in her own words, uh, both developing the mathematics and applying it to uh, physics questions. If you move from classical physics to quantum physics, you move from finite dimensional spaces to infinite dimensional spaces. Integration then becomes functional integration. So Feynman integrals, sometimes called path integrals, are a special type of a domain of fun uh, functional integration. At the end of his Nobel speech, Feynman said, I will misquote. You may ask me what happened to the beautiful young lady of my youth. Like all young women, she has become an old woman. She has very little attraction left with her. She has left me with some good children in the lab ship. The young lady was definitely the path integral. It was not a woman, it was the path integral. And uh, I was not going to let that go by, she said. I had worked on it and proved she is not just an old woman who has nothing left in her. There was something very interesting that had a lot of potential. So I sent him some of my work and I wrote him in the margin, she is beautiful in her own right. Uh, and she, he wrote back, he only dressed her up. Okay, so this is uh, part of her. Uh, she also went on an expedition to Mauritania uh, in which they, they had a telescope set up to show that light was deflected by gravity. Uh, um, you know that being massless, you would think that light would not be deflected by gravity because it's massless. Force is equal to uh, mass times uh, velocity. The mass is zero, force is zero. So, uh, so, but what Einstein says, it's not the force that matters, it's the curvature of space-time. And therefore, light will be deflected by intense gravitational fields. But nobody had actually, you know, measured the deflection. And so, uh, there, there, was a, there was a big expedition set up to uh, Mauritania. And uh, comparisons, uh, uh, and they took the measurements during the solar eclipse there, because the sun is much more in uh, the equator, right? And so the com a comparison of the pictures with those made six months later. So they stayed there for a year and kept on taking observations. And uh, light was indeed bent by, um, when passing by massless objects. So the bending of light was what the Mauritania ex expedition actually proved. And um, she became professor at a very late age because she was doing all these different things. Um, and then she was uh, awarded the Legion of Honor of the French government. And then she retired as a professor emeritus at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, these are some of the books you wrote. This book is my favorite book in mathematical physics. It's written by three women, Yvonne Chauffey Bruhar, Marianne Dillard, and uh, Dillard Blight, and Cécile Moret, uh, DeWitt Moret. And it's uh, all about how to apply mathematics to physics okay and it is written and it's an excellent book she also wrote a very interesting book called it uh, uh, information technology for intelligent grandmothers which i'm hoping to read soon and um, so uh, uh, so she was a true renaissance woman in her later life she started working on neuroscience and uh, on what physics would contribute to neuroscience and on, she uh, wrote for old people um, books on information technology. I'm really taking a lot of time. And now I come to another woman in the same era, and that is Mila Baldo Chelin. Mila Baldo Chelin was uh, born in 19, uh, well, it was nine, in 1952. She was a young girl then. She was born in 1920. Uh, 
26, I think. And uh, she graduated from the <coughs> University of Padua, and she, her thesis was also on the bio. And uh, little did she imagine that in 1963, she would <coughs> occupy the position which Galileo had at the University of Padua. She was the first woman a professor at Padua University, in the oldest university in the world, where Galileo was the initial, one of the initial professors, okay? So her research was, again, in particle physics, and uh, she was particularly concerned with the weak force. And in those years, you know, again, the post-war years, theories, models, brilliant ideas followed each other, and innovative experiments were designed and devised all over the world. So this is where Bruno Rossi had talked about cosmic rays, and so she wanted to work on cosmic rays and continue the legacy of Bruno Rossi. So in 1950s, uh, the main type of detector we had was the photographic emulsion, and kaons and hyperons were being discovered. Okay? So she uh, worked in Padua first, and first she worked on K-naught, K-naught bar mixing, and uh, by exposing stacks of nuclear emulsion to the Bevatron, and then they, they experimentally uh, demonstrated that k is a mixture of k naught and k naught bar. And then after that, uh, after the, the anti-proton and anti-neutron were discovered, uh, Mila started uh, looking at extending the results to other particles and they, for, for, they found she is the discoverer of the anti-hydron or anti-lambda particle. Okay, so this is a... So, she was a brilliant and unconventional experimentalist, always thinking out of the box. And when the first synchrotron accelerators at CERN became available, she was one of the first persons who had the idea of exposing nuclear emulsion plates to a pion beam. And that is, uh, that is when she discovered the anti, uh, anti hadron or the anti lambda. So uh, she was uh, a member of the liquid deuterium bubble chamber collaboration. And then after that, she started the Icarus detector at Ram Sasso. So in 1988, she started the workshops on neutrino telescope at Venice, you know, because the first telescope had seen the, the stars, Galileo had seen the stars at Venice. So she said, well, I want to uh, concentrate on neutrino telescope. What a neutrino telescope? I'll just tell you. So she, uh, uh, so on the 400th anniversary of the using of telescope to discover the heliocentric uh, nature of the universe, uh, Mila started the uh, neutrino workshops at uh, Venice, okay? And uh, so she also coined the name neutrino telescope. So neutrino telescopes are another kind of telescope to go alongside telescopes for light, X-rays, infrared, we have all these. Well, neutrino telescope looked deep into space for the sources of cosmic rays and to study supernovae, and they can reveal the structure inside the Earth. So what they actually measure neutrinos. And one of the neutrino telescopes that we have right now in the world is the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory, which is at the, uh, which is at the South Pole, and that is a neutrino telescope. So Mila was a real descendant of Galileo for both the scientific results must be sought through a careful analysis of both the experimental data, but driven by theoretical vision, okay? So in that sense, she is a true pupil of, you know, the, the person who she admires the most. So she was given the golden mimosa and because she was involved in social battles, uh, in defense of democracy and emancipation of women. And um, this is traditionally given to women who are who have contributed to Italian society. And this is what the Manoza flower looks like. It is a fitting representation of Mila. Okay. Then we come to our own living. Most of these uh, women that we talked about in the series are no more, but we have one uh, person who has given back a lot to society and she is from India and she's a very good physicist and, and we honor her here in Hyderabad. And you can see uh, some of us here. And we honored her um, with a Lifetime Achievement Award in Hyderabad. And um, so she also brought, not only did she do a lot of very good work in plasma physics, she was the first person to one of the first directors of the Trieste, ICTP Trieste Plasma School, which um, 
So she says that when she was an associate at ITPP, during one of my visits to ITPP, Professor Salam asked me if I'd be willing to be one of the directors of the plasma physics colleges, where, uh, which were being held at ITPP every year. Thus, even without completing my associate, I took over as one of the directors of the plasma physics college and held the position to 2003. And this um, ICPP school, which is now called ICPP IAA school, is aimed to provide the best possible training in plasma physics, uh, being a way of maturing scientists from all over the world with an emphasis for developing countries. So she also opened up the world in, uh, of plasma physics to the developing countries. Not only that, she is a big philanthropist and she has a foundation called the Bhuti Foundation and she formed it from her retirement money. So when she retired, you know, you get a lot of gratuity and you know, provident fund and things. So she invested it into a, um, into a foundation. And this foundation, um, you know, it, it institutes awards for students, young scientists through the Plasma Society of India, through Plasma Science Society of India, Indian Physics Association, Physical Research Laboratory, Indian Institute of Technology, National Academy of Sciences, Manasthal University, Ramsar and Gujarat Science Academy. These three awards are managed by Miranda House and have been instituted for best visually challenged students for first, second, and third years. And also, uh, she said during the couple of years before my superannuation, I started feeling along with my research work, I must do something for society. So as you grow older, you have two hands, one for yourself and one for giving to others. And this also has a cancer um, center in Bareilly, uh, and it, it has a public library. It has centers for science and society at Ahmedabad. Um, in Ahmedabad, um, Bareilly and Delhi and Indore. And it is to increase interaction between scientists and non-scientists and to attract students to science careers. And they have um, in centers, they have organization of science awareness, competitions with school children, public lectures, awareness, medical camps, first aid training, ambulance for ambulance drivers, police constables, etc. Okay, so there is also a Booty Foundation Award. Um, so this is IPM in Love Booty. There is a Physics Booty Foundation Award, which is given to scientists below 40 years who has made an outstanding contribution to theoretical physics, astrophysics, or biophysics. Okay, and in 2019, we honored her here at Hyderabad by giving her Lifetime Achievement Award. So, so these are not just, you know, foreign women who have a lot of money. These are women like us who have actually, you know, given back to society and opened doors for others. So, Babi Nari are not only women in physics. They are not only lightning women. They are super women, kind women, smart women, and giving women. Um, and Paminaris are the light that help other people see. So thousands of, Buddha said, thousands of candles can be lighted from a single candle. And the life of the candle will not be shortened. Happiness is never decreased by being shared. So yeah. Also, maybe in, you can Somebody ask them it. that they can write it in the chat, chat box. Yeah. Uh, so shall I stop sharing? Yeah. Let me see if there are some questions on the chat box. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, Any questions? The questions are clearly in the chat box. People can also raise hand and ask. Yeah, you can yeah. raise hands. Yeah. So just a comment, uh, Bindu, very, very nice talk and very informative. A lot of <laughs> learned, always learned about. Uh, so really a lot of things I didn't know. Thank you. Very nice talk. She just finished speaking. <laughs> oh, can you say that again? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. So I was just saying that the talk was very, very nice and interesting. And I learned a lot of things which I uh, did not know uh, about, uh, I, I mean, the, uh, her uh, stay at TIFR and all that. Yeah. So for many of these women scientists, this is what happens that we know very little about them. So thank you very I'd much. I'd like to make just one more comment that I didn't make because we were talking about 
mostly about much older women scientists, but I would like to acknowledge three more scientists who have given back or are giving back right now. Uh, Shobhana Narsimhan, she, ha she also uh, is uh, the first person to make uh, a uh, international school for women in physics for developing countries. And she goes to Africa and other places to, um, to involve women in physics. And then I would like to acknowledge Vandana Nanal, Prajwal Shastri and Subhavati Goswami and Rukmini Mahanta and, uh, uh, and uh, all the other women uh, who are uh, making now these uh, IPA more women friendly. So thank you. Prajwal started this and thank you Prajwal. Okay. Oh. Just waiting if there are some more comments and questions. Yeah, and Shikha, can I say something? Yeah, I'm not able to yeah. do this yet. Huh? Yeah, th th thank you, Bindu. Very nice talk, very informative. And really, it's a, it's a pleasure to always listen to you. And uh, I will also like to say that uh, many of our uh, women who have uh, made so much difference, like, of course, uh, um, uh, Prajwal and Shobhna, Pandana, Shubhavati, Rukmi. So I, I would also like to thank them. Uh, I, I have a, a small question for you. Can I ask you? Yeah, certainly. Yeah, yeah, very, very nice talk. No, I was a little, um, when you said that change brings uh, more women participation, I'm little, um, not, uh, I, I don't know how to put it, because uh, during COVID also, as you know, we saw that, of course, uh, women were participating in many, uh, many varieties of activities. But I think women are the one who got more affected because uh, uh, as we saw yeah. that they were the ones who were taking most of the responsibilities. Body. They are the ones yeah. who were suffering and uh, in all aspects, uh, they suffer. So I'm not sure when the change happens, change is always uh, beneficial. No, I'm to talking you. about change. During COVID, we suffered a lot, but now it is post COVID situation. So now will be the time for women to take charge. In uh, what respect can you I just mean, uh, 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 elaborate yeah, a little bit? Yeah. You know, what I'm saying is that uh, COVID reminded everybody of the, uh, the, you know, the delicacy or the fragility of life, you know. So when you, when you are faced with such life uh, challenging situation after th that happens, like after the war, I mean, then you feel that maybe it is time to, you know, do something for yourself and to take charge of your life, if you can. So you mean the, so the women are in forefront of uh, taking responsibilities for uh, their, uh, in, in science or in a, in a, in a uh, personal in a, framework? In a more general, it, as I said, that it is, a it is a social, the social milieu which engenders, science is just a part of society, right? So, uh, you know, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of women did actually find uh, uh, find their voice somehow uh, uh, online. I, I thought the increased participation of women online happened, and so that is carrying over. And a lot more, um, uh, so a lot more voices were heard were heard, and that propel, will propel them now that they have the freedom. That will propel them a little more to go ahead. Thus, I mean, society will be less judgmental i think now i hope so that's what happened uh, when you, i hope the society has opened up because it's <clears throat> faced complete extinction <clears throat> and uh, you know if if they suppress women more they uh, it'll it'll really face extinction is okay. what i think i don't know i'm just talking about history history teaching yeah, us yeah. this I, I don't know yeah. what's going to happen now yeah, I mean, I, uh, yeah, I, 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 I sort of see what you are saying, but I'm not sure I fully, uh, yeah, uh, agree? Uh, well, I, I, not agree is not the word I think go along with the, but yeah, as you say, in, uh, in history of things, the uh, things evolve, but how yeah, exactly history, will... whenever, uh, society has felt that it's going to completely be extinct. And they, therefore, it has started questioning its past. Mm -hmm. Then, in the uh, it's the it's the questioning period that I am saying really 
change right. with questioning. Yeah, I, I think it is important. Otherwise, we will. Uh, yeah, <laughs> it will be our loss. Yeah, unless we. Yeah. 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 Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bindu, for a very, very nice and informative talk. Thank you. I, I have a somewhat uh, um, unrelated comment. May I? Yeah, please. So this is related to uh, the pandemic, which we are saying. I think one advantage which has happened of the pandemic is this online platform. And I don't mean it is only for us to connect, but I felt that uh, during our Vigyan Vidushi summer school, and uh, uh, the, so what we found that we had these lectures which are on the YouTube and some of the students or aspirants, uh, young research aspirants who want to pursue a career are actually able to showcase the works of the women scientists or you know, just physicists, women scientists to their parents and the, the families so that to show that where the career path can lead them. Yeah, I think these online things have helped a lot of people a lot actually to open their worlds, I think. I mean, we, we can have our collaboration meetings online. <laughs> and, uh, so many no, online yeah, meetings. I'm saying it has gone a long borders, way. About transcending yeah. borders, actually. It, they have really helped us to transcend borders. Uh, so, I mean, here I am talking to you. <laughs> Any questions okay. from the audience? Yeah. No, there are a lot of comments in the Zoom chat box. Wonderful uh, talk, nice okay. talk. Got a lot of new information. Enjoyed yeah. very much. How come that. I don't see any of that? Yeah. In YouTube? Oh. oh, in the YouTube. Okay, we are not seeing the YouTube. Uh, Bindu, no, I, have Zoom, I saw a few comments. In, in the Zoom, some of them are just sent to the host. They meant to send to all, but they have sent to Do I want That's to see one and two of the series? Uh, how can I find that? You said that you promised that you will send the link. Professor is saying, how can he get lecture one and two of the series? Yeah, yeah, first one that one I, I, I have uh, uh, I have put the uh, link of the IPA web page, it has, but I'm also putting the playlist link. Just give me a second, I'll just put it. Yeah. Any questions from the audience? Somebody had a question in the audience. Bindu, can I ask a question? This is Ritaban. Yes, yes, please do, Ritaban. Please. Hi. I, uh, so Hi. thank you for, for, for the talk. Uh, it was nice to know about. I did not know about at least one of them. Um, so uh, I was wondering Mila. that, uh, I mean, not to question your choice, but uh, just to know your uh, sort of line of thinking. And is there any uh, uh, sort of why? Why did you yeah. choose? So I, I was, why did I choose these women? Well, first yeah. I chose these women because uh, because they devoted uh, uh, their life to sort of giving back to society. That, uh, I don't think you were here at the beginning of the right. No, no, no. I, I was. I was. I okay. my internet and that was. and the other is because you know I my my field is mathematical physics, right? Right. So I wanted to see the some of the women who, um, you know, who made a contribution to mathematical. Well, it's mathematical physics and to uh, and high energy physics. But I I uh, wanted to see women who made big contributions to mathematical physics also. Right. right so okay. that's, that's yeah. So in, in and society. So combining mathematical physics and society. So okay. so these. That's the way. That's the way my mind worked when I was selecting. Okay. Students. That I understand. And uh, you know, uh, Professor Bimla Bhuti, I gave because you know she is an exam example. You know, an exemplary example. <laughs> I mean. Uh, I've just retired and I didn't think of putting all my money into a trust and helping others and now I should think about it. So, you know. Yes, and I, and I see that Professor Bhuti is in the audience. Yes, yes, yes she's there. Uh, actually, maybe we could request uh, uh, her for a few comments. Rukmini? Yes, I think so. Vimla ji? Vimla ji? You know, sometimes uh, she, uh, uh, ah, there she is. 
हाँ दे शी इज या आई एम आस्किंग अर टू अनम्यूट अनम्यूट या we should have a, a talk about her life but there wasn't enough time first yeah. of all i would like to thank the speaker for an excellent exposition and also saying good word about my mom i very much appreciate that and would like to extend my wishes to i pay for taking up this adventurous job please keep it on this will give a big encouragement to the young women students who would like to become scientists and in particular physicists thank you Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Bhutti, for attending the lecture, and that you will be ninety this year. <laughs> I remember in the lecture she gave at TIFA for these young students. She said, "Don't give up," and that was said many times. That's a very, very useful message and extremely uh, motivating to all of us. Thank you so much. Okay. No, thank you uh, bindu it was uh, a wonderful talk you know i also didn't know so many things that you said thank you thank you thank you maybe maybe i can... think uh, the vote of thanks will be given by ashoka yeah <laughs> uh, uh thanks for all of you who have been attending both online and uh, being here and uh, thank you professor bindu for such a nice enlightening uh, lecture most of us i'm sure we did not know and we came to know about uh, some trail blazing women who did some wonderful work uh, so thanks once again uh, thanks to ipa the main chapter for organizing this uh, and thank once again for all of you who have come here and those who have been online uh, patiently listening to us thank you once again thank you very much okay bye